Okay, I'm going to start this morning by welcoming everyone. Sawadee Kap, Sawadee Kap, welcome to everyone. Nice to see you guys all here this morning. This is our Pali Canon in English study group where we study the original words of the Buddha in order to help you on your journey to enlightenment. This is a program that oftentimes students have already developed a foundation in the teachings of the Buddha before they move into. But if this is your first time here, you'll be able to learn surely. But you'll see that the way that I teach is more like a study group versus a traditional style of learning where on some Mondays and Wednesdays and other days where I'm teaching courses and retreats. It's more of a traditional style of learning, but today is more of a study group. And I'll teach you more about what that is after we do our meditation because we start our classes with meditation. The teachings of the Buddha are to guide you to this mental state where the mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. You no longer experience any discontent feelings. So all the anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety, loneliness, boredom, shyness, resentment, jealousy, even the slightest displeasure is eliminated from the enlightened mind. You can train the mind to uproot the pollutions that are causing the mind to experience these feelings. So the teachings of the Buddha, it's not about believing a bunch of things and then hoping something good happens when you die. It's also not about rules or commandments or anything like this. So you're learning teachings, you're investigating them and examining them. You're reflecting on them to independently verify them and see whether they're true or they're false. And then you're practicing them, you're integrating them into your life in order to transform your mind and uproot the pollutions of the mind that the Buddha discovered. And as you do so, you'll see the more peace and joy coming into the mind until eventually you get to the permanent mental state where the mind is always peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. So meditation is an important part of that, but you would need to learn other things besides meditation in order to get to the enlightened mental state. So that's why I share teachings after we do our meditation. So if you'd like to join for meditation, I'm going to share with you breathing mindfulness meditation, which is a primary form of training that the Buddha used in addition to everything else in order to get to enlightenment. I'm going to start with some chanting. The chanting that we do is in the Pali language. This is the original language that the teachings of the Buddha are captured in. And these chants are on a laminated sheet on the table over there. For all of you guys that are joining us online in either Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, you can get this chanting sheet on our website at buddhadailywisdom.com. Just click on free books and you'll see the chanting sheet there because I'm going to chant these to ease into meditation, but you're welcome to chant along as well. I see some of you guys have the chanting sheets. If you read the English translations, you'll see what those chants mean. And if you read it, you'll see a lot of admiration, gratitude, and respect for the Buddha. Well, I suspect the Buddha didn't actually create these chants himself because during the lifetime of the Buddha, they only used chanting as a way to commit the teachings to memory. So when I'm chanting, this isn't a rite, a ritual, or a ceremony, or worship. It's not prayer or anything like that. It's just to help ease the mind into meditation and actually get more benefit out of the meditation itself. So these chants probably weren't even created by the Buddha. They were probably created by his students either during his life or after his death because as you see, there's a lot of admiration, gratitude, and respect for the Buddha and a Buddha has already eliminated their ego. They're not going to walk around being arrogant and prideful and boastful. They're not going to teach their students to chant things like this to them. Instead, they're going to be humble and down to earth. So these chants are something that I use to ease the mind into meditation and actually get more benefit out of the meditation. And you're welcome to chant along if you like. After the chanting, I'm going to go into some guidance where I'll be guiding you in meditation as we're all meditating together. Those of you here and those of you guys online will just all be meditating together at the same time. Then there'll be a period of time where it'll just be quiet. I won't be providing any guidance at all. We'll just all be meditating together. I'm sure you hear an occasional noise or dog barking, a bird chirping, something like this. But nonetheless, it'll just be quiet with all of us uh, meditating together. Then we'll come out of the meditation with some chanting and then that's where I'll start the class. Class. In terms of your body positioning for meditation, there's four positions that the Buddha taught. He taught seated, lying, standing, and walking position. Oftentimes people are learning in the seated position. This can be kind of like a primary position that you might use for meditation. So people sit on the floor, sit in chairs, sit on a sofa, sit on a bench. You can sit wherever you're comfortable. There's not just one way to position the body during meditation, but I'll give you a little bit of guidance, but it's up to you to find what's comfortable for you. If you're sitting on the floor, you might like to have your legs just lightly crossed, whereas if they're real tight, it will impede the circulation. So you'd like them to be just kind of nice and lightly crossed. Some people like to actually put their legs off the mat. This gets the hips up in the air and it lessens the angle at the hips, the knees, and the ankles. And again, it allows the circulation to flow in the lower body. 
the hands and the arms, the Buddha put his right hand over his left with his thumbs together and he put this into his lap. If this is comfortable for you, you could use it. But again, it's not about everybody doing it exactly the same way. So there's other options here as well. Some people like to put their palms on their thighs or on their knees or their palms up. Some people like to rest their hands in their lap. You find whatever's comfortable for you, including anybody who would like to sit in a chair, find what's comfortable for you. Oftentimes people like to put their feet flat on the floor or cross at the ankles, and then their hands and arms just go wherever you feel comfortable. The upper body should be erect. This keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation, or so you can actively train the mind during the meditation. If your sternum is up and your shoulders are back, not only will the mind be attentive and alert, but you can easily breathe in through the nose and out through the nose, taking some nice, gradual, steady, consistent breaths. So as I mentioned, I'm going to ease us into meditation with some chanting. You're welcome to join along, and then I'll come back with some guidance. <clears throat> Ara-ha-ng-sam-ha-ta-ma-ke-wa-ta-ma-ke-wa-ng-a-pi-wa-te-ya-mi-sa-wa-ka-ta-ma-ke-wa-ta Namang namasami Supati pano makawato Sawakasanko Sanghang namami Namurasa bhagavato arato sama samputasa Namurasa bhagavato arato sama Samputasa Namurasa Bhagavato Arato Sama Samputasa Iti Pisu Mahakawa Arahang sama samoto, wicacaranang samuno, sekatoro kawitu, anu teroporisa. Nama sati sata tawa manu senang Puto bhagavati Okay, with the lower body and hands and arms comfortable in the upper body erect, just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Here you would like to just develop a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. Not forced or controlled. Just a gradual inhale through the nose, experiencing the full breath. And then whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Breathing in. And 
and out. Breathing in. Your breath may not match up with the guidance that I'm providing, and that's okay. This is your practice. I'm just here for guidance. You can use this voice as a reminder that whenever you get to the next inhale, breathing gradually through the nose, developing a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. And then, whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose, experiencing the full breath. Breathing in and out. Breathing in. and out. Once the breath is well established, start focusing the mind on the breath, either the sound of the breath coming into the nose or the sensation of air moving over the skin into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. With the mind fixated on the breath, whenever you notice that it moves off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to observe the thought, label it, judge it, analyze it, or even try to figure out where it's coming from. Whenever you notice that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of focusing on the breath, cutting off and letting go anytime the mind moves off the breath. You have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in and out.
Once again, I'll just welcome all of you guys that are here at the temple. Welcome to everyone. Welcome to everyone who's joining us online. Nice to see all of you guys here today, interested to learn the teachings of the Buddha. For those of you guys that it's your first time here, I'd like to just let you know that there's a bathroom in the back of the room. It's the very last door on the right. You're always welcome to use the restroom anytime you like. There's even restrooms outside the classroom. If you go outside these doors, you can follow the signs around to the main temple bathrooms and you're welcome to use those at any time. We even have water and there's some snacks that are showing up from our students. This is all provided by our students. You're welcome to help yourself and make yourself comfortable. So the teachings of the Buddha are to guide you on this journey to training your mind and getting to this enlightened mental state and there's various teachings that you need to learn in order to get to enlightenment and here at this temple and throughout all the other resources and platforms that I use I share the original teachings of the Buddha based on his actual words and you can take various foundational programs that we have we have something called the group learning program which is on Sundays and Wednesdays and you can attend that here you can attend it online from your home country wherever you are you can be learning the teachings of the Buddha in a live class and they're even recorded so if you're not able to make the live classes you can also watch the recordings this is done on Sundays and Wednesdays at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. Thai time so depending on what time it is in your time zone you're able to attend we even have books and videos podcasts and various resources audiobooks personal guidance that you can receive all of this is available to you at no cost to help you gradually learn the teachings of the Buddha and move your mind closer and closer to the enlightened mental state so that you can heal from what hurt you so that you never need to hurt ever again. By the time you get to enlightenment, you won't experience any painful feelings. All the pain and difficulties that you've experienced in life, all the struggles, it's coming from within the own mind, your own mind, and you can actually train your mind, gaining the wisdom of how to do that 
and then escape these painful feelings where you don't need to experience the constant difficulties and struggles over and over and over again. When you're having those struggles and difficulties, it's just that the mind lacks wisdom. There's certain wisdom that the mind lacks and it doesn't understand certain things about the natural world around you. And because of that, lack of wisdom, the mind struggles. So what the teachings of the Buddha are here for is to provide you the wisdom of the natural world around you, helping you to understand what's called the natural laws of existence. And you're not believing those things. You're learning them, examining them, investigating them. You are reflecting on them to independently verify them. And then you're integrating them into your life and practicing the teachings to transform your mind and uproot certain pollutions that the Buddha discovered about the mind. So that's what we do here in all these foundational programs and then we have various courses and retreats throughout the month and throughout the year. And then we have this program called the Pali Canon in English Study Group, where we study the actual words of the Buddha. And all the books and all the resources that I share, it's all based on the original words of the Buddha. But here in this program, we actually study the actual words of the Buddha in more like a study group. So all the foundational programs, we use volume one of this book series that I share. The book series is called The Words of the Buddha, The Path to Enlightenment, Revealing the Hidden. And volume Volume one is a foundational text. It's titled Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment. And then in this program, in the Pali Canon in English Study Group, we study volumes two through 13. And now we're in volume 12. So this is a year and a half program where students are gradually learning all the different discourses of the Buddha in very uh, in, in sections to be able to kind of digest the golden nuggets of the teachings of the Buddha rather than study the very long discourses, which oftentimes the Buddha's teaching many different things in those teachings, the way that this particular book series does it is it breaks it up into excerpts where you can get one, two, or three golden nuggets in any particular discourse or chapter that is being shared. So the way that I do this program is I invite students here at the temple and those of you guys on Zoom that if you would like to volunteer to read a particular chapter out loud, uh, these chapters are very short. You can see this one. This one actually is a little bit longer than normal. It looks like it's three and a little bit of a page here. Normally, they're, they're even less than this. They're sometimes just one page. But I invite you guys to volunteer to read a particular chapter here. And if you'd like to volunteer to read a chapter here at the temple, if you could use the microphones here in the white bowl, just take it back to your seat with you. There's a gray button. You just press it. The lights come on and you just wait a second or two, hold it up to your chin, and then we'll be able to hear you here at the temple and they'll be able to hear you online as well. And for those of you guys in Zoom, if you'd like to read, you can electronically raise your hand and then open up your microphone and we'll be able to hear you here at the temple and they'll be able to hear you on the live stream as well. After a student reads the chapter, then I will share some teachings on that just for like five minutes or so, helping you understand a bit about what the Buddha is teaching because his teachings are very clear, very concise and very precise. But oftentimes his a particular teaching, it might be related to another teaching. So you need somebody to guide you through and help you to understand these various teachings and how they all integrate and then how to integrate these teachings into your life to actually glean real benefit out of the, doing the work on a day-to-day -day basis. And then after I share some teachings on a particular chapter, I will open up to any questions that you guys have about what's been shared. So here at the temple, those of you guys online, you can ask any and all questions you like. If you guys are asking questions here at the temple, if you could use the microphones, those of you guys online in Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, you can put your questions into the comment section. I'll be able to see that and answer your question. And then in Zoom, you can also electronically raise your hand, open up your microphone, and then ask any questions that you like. And for those of you guys here at the temple, if you get a microphone, you can just keep it with you because you might have some questions or you might decide to volunteer to read again or someone around you might need it so you can share it with the people around you. So is there someone who would like to volunteer to read this chapter either here at the temple or online? Yes, ma'am. Six and surplus things, monks. There are these six and past things. What six? Number one, the unsurplus sight. Number two, the unsurplus learning, hearing. Number three, the, the unsurplus gain. Number four, the unsurplus training. Number five, the unsurplus service. And six. The unsurpassed 
the correction the court remembers. Number one, and what monks is the Ransapa's sight? Here, someone goes to see the elephant gem, the horse gem, the jewel gem, gem, or to see various sight, or else they go to see an ascetic or burning of wrong views, of wrong practice. There is this seeing. This I do not deny, but this seeing is low, common, worldly, not honorable, and an and and beneficial. It does not lead to freedom from the strong feelings, admiration, peace, direct knowledge, experience, enlightenment, and a nibbana. When, however, one of settled confidence, of settled determination, decided for the confidence, goes to see the Tahagata or a disciple of the Tahagata. A disinterpreted side is for the pers- sorry, purification of beings, for the overcoming of sorrow and grief, for the passing away of pain and sadness, for the achievement of the method to attain enlightenment, for the realization of Nibbana, enlightenment. This is called the unsurpassed sight, such is the unsurpassed sight. Okay, let me just explain this part before we move on. So what the Buddha is describing here is that people can go see various people to learn and understand certain teachings about life. And what he's saying is that some people go to see unwholesome uh, people or people of wrong view or wrong practice, aesthetics and Brahmins. What an aesthetic is, is essentially a monk, what we would consider an ordained practitioner, someone who's given up worldly life and has entered into homelessness to be able to pursue this path to enlightenment. And what a Brahmin was during the lifetime of the Buddha and now is we might consider this person a Hindu priest, someone who's doing rites and rituals and ceremonies and worship in order to help people, at least that's their perception, is that they're helping people in their life, that during the lifetime of the Buddha, the belief was that you couldn't improve your life by yourself, that you had to go pay these people to do rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship. And when you paid them money and they did these rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship, you would go home and your life was supposed to get better. But of course, the Buddha knew that this wasn't true and he was teaching how to train your mind to be able to improve the quality of your mind and the quality of your life. But there were certain aesthetics, not necessarily people that have studied with him, but people that were studying with other teachers that those teachers were all claiming that it was their teachings that led to enlightenment and people were studying with those various teachers and they were aesthetics and there were certain Brahmin who were doing things that the Buddha would consider a wrong view, meaning that they didn't understand the wisdom that it took to be able to get to enlightenment. And the Buddha is saying that isn't what's going to lead to enlightenment. It doesn't lead to freedom from these strong feelings, which it would be the enlightened mental state. It doesn't lead to peace or wisdom or direct knowledge or experience. But he's saying, okay, when somebody comes to visit him or someone who study with him, the Tathagata, this is a Buddha. A Tathagata means the one who's discovered the truth or the one who shares the truth. This is the way the Buddha would refer to himself frequently, is he would refer to himself as the Tathagata. And he says, okay, when someone comes to visit me or they visit one of my students who have deeply learned these teachings, then that is for the purification of the mind. That's where you're learning how to uproot the pollutions that are in the mind. And now by purifying the mind, you're overcoming this grief and sadness and this uh, painful feelings. And this is what leads to the achieving of enlightenment or Nibbana. Because during the lifetime of the Buddha, he wasn't the only one teaching. You might think that if a Buddha was in the world, that everybody would learn from the Buddha. But not everybody understands how to identify a Buddha. There's not any kind of outward physical characteristics that everybody could know that he was the Buddha. And a Buddha doesn't go around performing a bunch of miracles to try to convince people that they're a Buddha. It's actually better if people don't know who a Buddha is because then the individual who's a Buddha can actually observe the mind of their students in a way that actually will be beneficial and helpful for them. Whereas if everybody knew who a Buddha was, like say their ear was turned a certain way or their nose was turned 
turned a certain way, then people would be on their best behavior when they were around that person. And the Buddha wouldn't be able to then help that individual through observing their mind, seeing what's going on in their mind, and then sharing teachings with them that would actually be able to help them. So not everybody knew that the Buddha was an actual Buddha. If you were studying with him and you knew his background and you could see his teachings and understood where he was headed, you would know that he was a Buddha. But there were plenty of people in the community that didn't know he was a Buddha because he didn't go around performing miracles. His teachings are independently verifiable. When you're learning and practicing his teachings, you can independently observe that his teachings are true and they're leading to an improved condition of mind. So a Buddha doesn't need to perform miracles because the students, if they apply effort and energy to learning, they can independently verify what it is that he's teaching, that it's true. And they can see the condition of their mind improving because they know in situations where you're once angry and sad or frustrated or agitated or annoyed or other discontent feelings. And when you're learning the teachings and you're training your mind and you're experiencing those same exact situations, but yet your mind is peaceful and joyful in those same situations, you'll know it's these teachings that has led you to that. So the teachings of the Buddha are what lead to that. And the Buddha is referring to this as unsurpassed sight. Whenever he's talking about sight, he's talking about clear vision of being able to see the natural world and see these natural laws, being able to awaken to the wisdom that it's going to take to get to enlightenment. He often refers to it as sight or seeing or vision, having clear vision. This is meaning that you can see the world because when your mind is polluted with all the various pollutions that the Buddha discovered, it's like looking out at the world through a dirty window. And when you look out at that world through the dirty window, things look pretty dirty. You're looking through your own ego, your own arrogance, your own judgment of other beings. You're looking through your own central desire, your own ill will, all these other pollutions that the Buddha discovered. And now things look pretty messy in the world when you look at other people. But when you clean off your window and you purify your mind, and now you look out at the world, you can see things in a very different way. So that's why the Buddha says people that are learning with him develop this unsurpassed sight, being able to see very clearly the world. Okay, so that's this first part. And now he's going to go into other things where he's talking about now hearing. And you actually don't have to read all of this junko because uh, I can just summarize it because here he's just talking about hearing and it comes down to the same thing where the individual is actually learning from an aesthetic or Brahmin who is of wrong view or wrong practice, but then ultimately they learn with the Buddha or somebody that is one of his disciples or one of his students. And now because of that, they're now receiving this ability to have this unsurpassed hearing and being able to hear things in an unsurpassed way. And then the same thing in terms of people acquiring certain goods, right? Then in terms of the Buddha, he's saying, okay, the best gain that you could gain would be the gain of the wisdom that leads you to enlightenment, like gaining the wisdom of what it takes to get to enlightenment. That's the very best thing you could ever acquire in your life. Acquiring a Lamborghini or a Ferrari or a beautiful wife or husband or lots of wealth and a house. Okay. All that stuff is impermanent. It's going to fade away, but the wisdom that it takes to get to enlightenment and then that enlightened mental state that you experience by the time you get to enlightenment, your mind's permanently peaceful and permanently joyful. You'll never experience anger and sadness ever again. So that's why the Buddha here is saying, okay, this is the unsurpassed gain of something that you can gain in your life and acquire in your life that is far beyond any material possession that you would ever try to acquire or have acquired. And then he talks about this unsurpassed training, right? He talks about someone here who trains in elephantry, horsemanship, chariotry, archery, so forth and so on, and or trains with an individual who has wrong view or has wrong practice. But then he says, okay, this unsurpassed training is training with the Tathagata, training his in his teachings or someone who's sharing his teachings to get to enlightenment. This is the unsurpassed training because it's going to lead to permanent peace and permanent joy in this life. This is the very unique thing about the teachings of the Buddha, that it's not about believe, 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 and hope something good happens when you die. It's about learning now, reflecting now to independently verify the teachings now and practicing now. And you see the results now in this life. You'll know that you're learning the truth because the condition of your mind and the condition of your life is gradually improving. So that's why he refers to it as the unsurpassed training. And then the unsurpassed service, right? He's going through the same things. And now the unsurpassed recollection or recalling or memory, 
right? Recollecting certain things. It's like, okay, great. You can recollect those particular things, but then being able to recollect the teachings that lead to purification of the mind, that's the unsurpassed uh, recollection is that you're able to remember the teachings, soak them into the mind, and now you can practice them readily. So this is what this particular chapter is all about, is helping you to understand those things. I'll just see if you guys have any questions here at the temple or anybody online. You guys can ask any of the questions that you like. Remember online, you can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or in Zoom, you can raise your hand and ask any questions that you like. You guys have any questions? Sure. Go ahead, Steve. Thank you, David. So there it's talking about um, back in the day, you know, people would go to an ascetic or a Brahmin, maybe with good intentions, you know, but mm -hmm. then they're getting the wrong view. Mm -hmm. I guess in this day and age with YouTube and Instagram and all that, I mean, I'm speaking from experience that you can spend a gazillion hours mm -hmm. <laughs> reading, getting, teaching from this person and teaching from this person. And it can be quite, you know, it can get you down different rabbit holes here and there. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, of course you have people offering, you know, weekend courses to enlightenment and the like. Um, so, yes, that's that's referring, I guess, to the same thing that they're getting, going to an ascetic or a Brahmin. But, I mean, my goodness, these days it's, you, one is being bombarded, literally, um, with different views of how to improve one's life or you know how to uh, yeah get to enlightenment or whatever so it's more just a comment but to, but i guess that would be the same thing right instead of going to an asadic or a brahmin i'd start one can start following this person on on youtube or this person on instagram and getting the knowledge in here and there yeah yeah, that's that's where it comes down to your own individual practice and your own wisdom and being able to understand what enlightenment is and the type of training and the type of teachings that it is that you need in order to get to that. If you understand what enlightenment is, which is where the mind's peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, you no longer experience any of that anger, sadness, frustration, all those discontent feelings, and you understand that in order to learn how to get to that mental state, you would need to learn from somebody who's attained that mental state or either very close to it. If somebody hasn't attained that mental state, they wouldn't be able to guide you to that enlightened mental state. So that's where if you understand what enlightenment is and you can see the qualities of that in a particular teacher, then you can have confidence that this individual has acquired that mental state or very close to it because you can see it in the way that they talk, in the way that they interact, their demeanor, the way that they function. And now if you study with one particular teacher, a set of teachings and a, a collection of teachings, by dedicating some time, whether it be one year, two years, three years, to really soak into those teachings, this will help you to not be distracted by all these other things. And now when you get really solid in that particular set of teachings, if you start looking at other things, this can actually help you to understand the teachings that you've learned more readily. But early on, if you're dabbling in too many things, it can actually confuse you because even within the same tradition of teachings, different teachers will describe things differently because of the universal truth of impermanence, not everybody's speaking about these teachings in exactly the same way. So if you study with one particular teacher for an extended period of time, this will help you get really solid, a really strong foundation, and then you'll make real progress and you'll know that your mind is improving. And then should you step out and start looking at other things, it can, this can actually be helpful to confirm for you what you learned is actually the truth. There are some teachers here in Thailand that if you become their student, they will ask you to stay with them for maybe six years before they will say, okay, you can go study with other teachers now. Because it's as a teacher, you would like to be able to help students be able to get to enlightenment. And if they're dabbling in so many different things from so many different people, as a teacher, you end up spending more time helping that person sort out all the confusion that they have than just making progress. Whereas if they would just learn the teachings from that one particular teacher, they could just keep making progress and progress and progress and progress and progress. But instead, this person who's dabbling over here, you're just, they're like a square, square one trying to figure out and eliminate all this confusion. And then once you help them eliminate the confusion, they go back out and get confused again by looking at a whole bunch more YouTube videos, like you say, or going to different places. And now you're right at the very beginning again, trying 
trying to help them sort out their confusion. Whereas if they just stay with one set of teachings and one teacher, they can just keep making progress. But that's where you need to be very confident about the teacher that you're learning with and that you should be able to see the qualities of enlightenment in their mind and the way they interact. And that's why it's in chapter, uh, volume one, chapter three, I put questions in there because the people who are going to study with me in this life okay, but there's going to be people who get this book and who study after I'm dead that aren't going to be able to necessarily know how to determine whether someone is either enlightened or close to enlightenment. So I put in that book, uh, volume one, chapter three, how to determine if somebody is enlightened or not. There are certain questions that you can ask, certain observations that you can make to determine whether somebody's enlightened. And you wouldn't be interested in doing this in a judgmental way, but using discernment or wise decision making, if you're going to invest six months, a year, two years of your time learning and growing, you would like to be able to have confidence that the person you're learning from has either attained enlightenment or close to it so that you can feel comfortable investing your time, effort, energy to learn and grow and develop. And one of the first things that you should be able to look at with any particular teacher is that they wouldn't be doing rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship as soon as you see rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship, you know that this isn't going to lead to enlightenment. And any teachings that are being shared, they should be able to be independently verified. So if you're able to see the qualities of enlightenment in the teacher, they're not doing rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship. Their teachings are independently verifiable. This is all indications that they're potentially sharing teachings that are going to lead to enlightenment. Some of the guidance that the Buddha gives on this is he shares that you should look at the quality of someone's mind. And if they're muddle-minded, meaning they're lacking concentration or lacking focus, he's saying this is an individual that isn't practicing his teachings very closely because when you have pollutions in your mind, it'll be very muddled. It'll be lacking concentration. But when you remove and eradicate the pollutions out of your mind, you'll notice there'll be focus, concentration, clarity, deep memory. And that's something that an average person, without even knowing anything about enlightenment, you would be able to see in somebody's mind is if their mind is muddled. This is what the Buddha describes it. He calls it muddle mindedness. So if you see a teacher that has a muddle mind, then this person hasn't yet deeply penetrated the teachings and aren't deeply practicing them yet. So this is a little bit of guidance to help you so that you don't go off and all those different directions and get confused, but you can find a teacher that you feel confident with that you can be guided and learn, but then always remember it's your own independent practice that you're growing and learning and developing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Question is um, so number five and number six of mm -hmm. the uh, six and surpassed things. So I'm not sure the unsurpassed service and then surpassed recognition uh, recorrection. So mm -hmm. um, if uh, would you would you um, give me some examples? What kind of service? What kind of correct um, recorrection? Yeah, so here you can see the Buddha saying, here, someone serves a katya. What a katya is, is this was during the lifetime of the Buddha. There was a population of people that the Buddha felt was practicing the teachings very closely without having even learned his teachings necessarily because these are the natural laws of existence. You can have people that tap into these at different times and discover them and kind of share these teachings. So he would kind of talk about the katya population as people who were very successful in life, having very harmonious relationships. So he said, Says here, someone serves a katya, a brahmin, a household, or or they serve various others, or else they serve an aesthetic or brahmin of wrong views, wrong practice. This kind of service, this I do not deny, but this kind of service is low, common, worldly, not honorable, and unbeneficial. It does not lead to freedom of strong feelings. So while this may be something that you can do in order to practice generosity, the Buddha says, okay, serving these individuals isn't going to lead to your enlightenment, that you're serving a katya, a brahmin, or a householder, or an aesthetic or brahmin of wrong view, meaning they don't have the wisdom that it takes to lead to enlightenment. But then he says, okay, however, one settled in confidence, meaning they have confidence in their teacher, like what I was just describing, settled in determination, meaning they're determined to get to enlightenment, decided, full of confidence, serves the Tathagata, or the disciples of the Tathagata. Well, if you're serving a Buddha or you're serving someone who 
deeply understands the teachings of the Buddha, you're coming in contact with somebody that can now share wisdom with you to help you get to enlightenment, right? So the Buddha is saying, okay, this is the unsurpassed service because now you're going to come in contact with people that's going to be able to help you get to enlightenment. And that's the ultimate goal is for you to cultivate wisdom. So that's why he's describing this as unsurpassed service because now you're able to actually cultivate the wisdom that it takes to get to enlightenment. Okay, so that's that one. Then the unsurpassed recollection or memory, he's saying, okay, somebody recollects the gain of a son, meaning remember, right? Remember their son, their wife, or wealth, or else they recollect various kinds of gain, or else they recollect an aesthetic or Brahmin of wrong view, meaning they, they remember these things, they recall it, right? It's in their memory. And the Buddha is saying, okay, this is low and worldly. It, it's unbeneficial because it's not going to lead to enlightenment by remembering those particular things. But if you have this confidence, this determination, this dedication, and you recollect, meaning you remember the teachings of the Buddha or one of his disciples, now by recollecting or remembering that, that is the unsurpassed memory. Because now you're memorizing the teachings, you're deeply committing them to your mind, and now you can practice them and actually experience liberation and the freedom of these strong feelings. Sorry, so it's it's uh, indicate so who I meet and then so uh, how to contact, how to talk to the um, the kind of good person or um an important person. So do do you mean like that? So recollecting something is like to remember it. Right. Yeah. So, so say you're here learning in class, right? And then you go home and you remember like, oh yeah, the Buddha taught about loving kindness and doing loving kindness meditation. Oh, I should go do my loving kindness meditation. This would be really helpful for me so I can go out in the world and be loving and kind to people. Okay. That's like the unsurpassed recollection. You've remembered something that's going to help you in the world. Mm -hmm. But if you just remember about material gain, if you remember uh, about, uh, you know, wealth and, and things like this, the Buddha is saying, this isn't going to lead to your enlightenment if you remember those things. So you have a limited capacity of memory in your mind. Yeah. <laughs> you would like to remember the teachings in terms of like, all the wealth and all the those other mm. things that you've done in your life at different times, the Buddha is essentially saying, set all that aside. Focus on learning the teachings and memorizing the mm. teachings. That's what's going to be the unsurpassed memory and things mm. to recall that's going to help you and benefit you in this life. Okay. Oh, okay. I see. It's a little bit I got it. So, mm. um, so uh, how much do I remember about the core stuff in in the life or so anyway not not ma not much like um so material stuff but but the other important yes. stuff okay. yeah so i'll give you an example like at one time in my life like i used to remember all the different hand positions of the statues of the buddha and uh, all these different symbols of different uh, statues and different things like this. I used to remember all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But when I started learning these teachings, I was like, ah, none of that leads to enlightenment. I'm going to just let all that go. I'm going to focus on learning the teachings of the Buddha. No need for me to remember all that stuff. Sometimes when I go on those tours to the temples, people will ask me, David, what is the meaning of that thing? And I was like, oh, I forgot. I was like, I used to know that, but I've let that go now. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I've cleared that out of my memory because <clears throat> it doesn't lead to enlightenment. So what you're interested in doing is remembering the things that lead to enlightenment because that's what's going to create real improvement in your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. I'm not seeing any other questions anywhere. Oh, Rex, you have a question? Yeah, yes, I do, David. These six uh, unsurpasses, it sounds like, since these are the words of the Buddha, one of them specifically addresses training. So it makes me wonder if just the sight of the Buddha or the hearing of the Buddha or the service to the Buddha at that time when he was alive was enough to achieve enlightenment because then he mm -hmm. then he goes on to mention I think it's number four or five the training mm -hmm. 
-hmm. which also, of course, the Eightfold Path leads to enlightenment. Mm -hmm. But since he's given us these six th things, it makes me think maybe it was enough at that time just mm -hmm. to see the Buddha, to hear the Buddha, or to be of service to the Buddha would have been enough to deliver enlightenment. Yeah. Well, you would still need to study. You would still need to train your mind. You would still need to meditate. But what that does is by coming in contact with a Buddha, a Buddha is going to have deep, profound wisdom about what it takes to get to enlightenment. Their mind's very clear, very focused. Uh, they, they have penetrating wisdom. They can speak about the teachings with ease, unlike any other person. And they're able to share teachings that are going to help you in a way that another person wouldn't be able to help you in the same same way so it's not just that you're in the presence of a buddha that you're going to instantly get to enlightenment this isn't actually true and wherever you see people talking about that kind of thing it's not possible for someone to instantly get to enlightenment it's gradual training gradual practice and gradual progress but by doing these things what he's talking about you know, the, some of the ones you were talking about is just coming in contact with the Buddha. You're now in proximity to a person that has deep wisdom that's able to help you to learn. It's kind of like if you were going to learn a particular skill and you knew that a professor at a college was very well respected for this particular skill, just going to that college, you're going to be in close proximity to that professor. And then even that professor themselves being at that particular college or university their wisdom has spread to other teachers at that university. So you're going to be in proximity to them as well. And now you're going to be able to glean more insight about this particular topic, whether it's electrical engineering or, you know, auto mechanic or anything like this, you're going to be able to now glean more information, but you're not going to instantly be able to get the wisdom of how to be it auto mechanic or an electrical engineer. Same thing with enlightenment. You're not going to be able to instantly be able to gain the wisdom to get to enlightenment. It's going to be gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. But proximity to the Buddha had to help. Yeah, that's because yeah. now you're close to him yeah. to be able to now ask him questions or hear what he's talking about to other people. You can observe how he's interacting in the world. These are all things that are going to help you because you're now close by. So you this is going to help you gain wisdom through your own observation and through listening and hearing and understanding, but you still need to do work in order to get to enlightenment. You can't just sit down at the feet of a Buddha and get to enlightenment. Yep. You're going to still need to do work. You still got to do the work. Mm -hmm. Just another uh, question. Uh, I'm presuming that the elephant jewel and the horse jewel were famous relics or something in that time that, People thought if they just went and looked at the elephant gem or the horse gem or maybe touched it, that would be beneficial to them. Yeah, we might think about like the Hope Diamond, right? Or there's probably some ruby somewhere that is known to be the most beautiful ruby yeah, in all yeah. of the world. These are those kinds of things. The Emerald right? Buddha. And, and so on. Yeah, the Emerald Buddha, right? <laughs> so people might think like, ah, this is the most beautiful sight I've ever seen. And the Buddha saying, oh, those things pale in comparison to the sight of being able to see the path to enlightenment. By being able to see the path to enlightenment, that's the unsurpassed sight. Looking at the Hope Diamond or the Emerald Buddha or things like that, that's not what's going to be helping you to get to enlightenment. But okay, those things are beautiful, but it's not the unsurpassed sight. Yep. All right, yes, ma'am. There's a question back here. Oh, yeah. Hi, David. I have a, actually want to follow up um, regarding the previous question about the unsurpassed recollection. Mm -hmm. um, so if we only study the, the words of Buddha, right? And then just uh, memorize all, all the wisdom from them. Uh, how are we different? Meaning if everybody studied the same word, same wisdom, same book, uh, will we become like really similar? How can we make our life or human beings diverse? Because I feel like everybody is unique. How can we live a different life? Yeah, for if there were, if every single person in here wasn't was enlightened, we're still all going to be very unique and very different. Uh, 
uh, in terms of our personality, our character, our hobbies, our activities. Getting to enlightenment doesn't mean it's a template of a person and everybody does exactly the same thing. Getting to enlightenment means you've purified your mind of the pollutions of your mind, but now your mind's functioning optimally. And now you're still going to have your own interests in terms of hobbies and activities, your unique job and personality and all these kinds of things. Uh, we're not all going to be exactly the same person. Sometimes people think of enlightenment that way, like it's like a template and everybody does exactly the same thing. These aren't, this is where you can see that these aren't rules. They're not commandments that, you know, here you're not learning the, the real deep teachings of what it takes to get to enlightenment. This is just kind of an ancillary teaching that the Buddha is sharing. But if you learn the deep teachings, they're not rules. They're not commandments. It's not a template that says you've got to conform to this and now check off all these boxes and you'll be enlightened. That's not what it is. The Buddha is explaining to you how your mind functions and how the world around you functions. He's basically taking human psychology and he's describing it in very common language that every average person could understand. And now when you apply that wisdom in your life and you uproot the pollutions of your mind, now it'll function optimally. So we'll all still be very unique in the world even as all enlightened beings thank you so mm -hmm. which means i could still remember a lot of like my own good memories right like it's still uh, besides the the words of buddha I guess. yeah this isn't to say that the only thing you should ever remember is the teachings of the buddha it's <laughs> saying that in terms of the unsurpassed memory of what's really going to lead to your enlightenment are the teachings of the buddha but there'll be enlightened beings who are helicopter pilots and politicians and you know stay-at-home mom and dad and uh, a person who chooses to be a taxi driver and things like this all these people are going to have certain memories about their life but in terms of what's the unsurpassed memory of the thing that's really going to benefit you the most in this world it's remembering the teachings that's what's going to benefit you the most but that's not to say that it's exclusive and you should only remember the teachings of the buddha there's other things you're going to remember in life as well thanks yeah great clarifying questions great job guys this is what a community of getting people who are getting to enlightenment would do is investigate the teachings and examine them and, and look for clarification so this is this is perfect there's actually a chapter here in this section of, of the book where the Buddha encourages his students to investigate and interrogate and examine his teachings. So this is, this is excellent. Okay, so let's move to the next one uh, since I don't see any more teachings or any more questions. By the way, these are the words of the Buddha in all of these books. This is a reference that takes you back to the original source teachings in the Pali Canon that you can go back and see because the Pali Canon is in 45 large volumes of books. And this is a reference that'll take you back there and you can see where this came from. And then you have reflections from me in each one of these chapters that are going to help you understand how to integrate it into your life and actually get benefit out of these teachings. So these books are all available for you at no cost. You can download them for free from our website. You can take them and go print them, or you can get printed versions here at the temple by just reimbursing us for our printing cost, or you can get them on Amazon if you have access to Amazon. So all of these books are available for you that way. So this is chapter 22. Is there someone who would like to volunteer to read this? Sure. I see a couple of hands. He's got a mic. Kushi. One of you can take the next one too. Take the next one, Steve. Demonstration of confidence in one endowed with confidence. This is the time for it, fortunate one. This is the time for it. Fortunate one, the perfectly enlightened one, should explain the demonstrations of confidence. Now I will find out whether or not this monk exhibits the demonstration of confidence. Then listen, Subhuti, and attend closely, I will speak. Here Subhuti, a monk, is virtuous, practicing moral conduct. He resides restraining by the training guidelines possessed of good conduct and wise decision-making, seeing danger in the slightest force. Having undertaken the training guidelines, he trains in them. This is a demonstration of confidence in one endowed with confidence. 2. Again, a monk has learned much, remembers what he has learned, and accumulates what he has learned. 
those teachings that are good in the beginning good in the middle and good in the end with the right meaning and phrasing which proclaim the perfectly complete and pure spiritual life such teachings as this he has learned much of retained in mind recited verbally mentally investigated and penetrated well by view this too is a demonstration of confidence in one endowed with confidence 3 again a monk has wholesome friends wholesome companions wholesome comrades this too is a demonstration of confidence in one endowed with confidence 4 again a monk is easy to correct and possesses qualities that make him easy to correct he is patient and receives instruction respectfully this too is a demonstration of confidence in one endowed with confidence 5 again a monk is skillful and diligent in attending to the diverse chores that are to be done for his fellow monks he possesses sound ability to make decisions about them in order to carry out and arrange them properly this too is a demonstration of confidence in one endowed with confidence 6 again a monk adores the teachings and is pleasing in his statements filled with significant joy in regard to the teachings and disciple this too is a demonstration of confidence in one endowed with confidence 7 again a monk has aroused energy for abandoning unwholesome qualities and acquiring wholesome qualities he is strong firm in effort not casting off the duty of cultivating wholesome qualities this too is a demonstration of confidence in one endowed with confidence 8 again a monk gains at will without trouble or difficulty the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind and are peaceful dwellings in this very life this too is a demonstration of confidence in one endowed with confidence 9 again a monk recollects recalls remembers his countless past lives that is one birth two birth three birth four births five births 10 births 20 births 30 births 40 births 50 births 100 births 1000 births a hundred thousand births many eons of world dissolution many eons of world evolution many eons of world dissolution and world evolution thus there is, there i was so named of such a clan with such an appearance such was my food such my experience of pleasure and pain such my life span passing away from there i was reborn elsewhere and there too i was so named of such a clan with such an appearance such was my food such my experience of pleasure and pain such my life span passing away from there i was reborn here thus he recollects recalls or remembers his countless past lives with their aspects and details <laughs> This too is a demonstration of confidence in one endowed with confidence. Then again with the divine eye third eye which is purified and surpasses the human a monk sees beings passing away and being reborn unwholesome and wholesome beautiful and ugly fortunate and unfortunate and he understands how beings fare in accordance with their karma thus these beings who engage in misconduct by body speech and mind who abusively criticized the noble ones held wrong view and undertook unwholesome karma based on wrong view with the break up of the body after death have been reborn in the place of misery in a bad destination in the lower world in hell but these beings who engage in wholesome conduct by body speech and mind who did not abusively criticize the noble ones who held right view and undertook wholesome karma based in based on right view with the break up of the body after death have been reborn in a good destination in a heavenly world thus with a divine eye third eye which is purified and surpasses the human he sees beings passing away and being reborn unwholesome and wholesome beautiful and ugly fortunate and unfortunate and he understands how beings fare in accordance with their karma 
This too is a demonstration of confidence in one endowed with confidence. 11. Again, with the destruction of the taints, a monk has realized for himself with direct knowledge, experience, in this very life, the taintless liberation of the mind, liberation by wisdom, and having entered upon it, he resides in it. This too is a demonstration of confidence in a one endowed with confidence. Okay, thank you, Kushi. So I'm not going to be able to go through each individual one of these in our talk here. I have done that in the uh, book where I de document each individual one, but I'll just kind of touch on a couple of these. And then any questions you guys have about the ones I talk about or even the ones I don't talk about, you're welcome to ask questions about as you like. So the Buddha is saying here in order to develop confidence in these teachings, because you're going to need confidence in the teachings. The opposite of confidence would be doubt. That oftentimes when people come to the past, to enlightenment, they have doubt about the teachings. And this is normal. If you have doubt about whether the Buddha existed, if you have doubt about whether enlightenment is actually possible, whether you or have the ability to get to enlightenment, whether your teacher has the ability to guide you to enlightenment, these kinds of doubts and others kind of factor into the mind and will hinder you from being able to get to enlightenment. But the way you eliminate your doubt is you build confidence. And you build confidence in the Buddha, the teachings, the community that you're part of, your teacher, and your own ability to get to to enlightenment. And this confidence will help you to break through to stay dedicated and determined and diligent, eradicating any complacency on the path to enlightenment. So the Buddha here is providing you guidance about how to develop that confidence and eliminate any doubt that you have in your mind about his teachings. But that's going to happen gradually and slowly. You can't just, you know, sit down in three minutes and instantly eliminate your doubt. When you have doubt, you can actually harness it to have an inquisitive mind. Whereas if you allow your doubt to erode your confidence, confidence and become complacent and push away from the path to enlightenment, then you won't be able to get to enlightenment. But if you harness your doubt and turn it into an inquisitive mind where you're like, yeah, I doubt the teachings of the Buddha and I want to you know, look at them. I'm interested in investigating them and examining them. That's what I did. I rolled up the sleeves. I sunk my teeth into it and I tried to discover whether they're true or whether they're false. And the more you investigate his teachings, you'll see that they're true. And they lead exactly where he says they do to this peace and this joyful mental state that is enlightenment. So here he's sharing with you the first part of gaining confidence is to practice this moral conduct that you learn about the training guidelines and you practice in accordance with the moral conduct because the moral conduct that he's teaching you is cause and effect or action and result. He's teaching you about ways that you cause harm through your intentions, your speech, and your actions, and your livelihood. And when you learn about those things and you investigate them and reflect on them and then integrate them into your life and you start practicing them, you'll see that you're causing less and less harm in the world and less and less harm is coming back to you. You'll see that the condition of your mind and the, your relationships around you and your life are are drastically improving, this is how you'll know that, ah, these teachings are actually working because it's leading to an improved condition of my mind and an improved condition of my life. And this will help you to gain confidence. So by learning the moral conduct, you're shutting down the harm that you're causing to other beings by learning about the natural law of gamma of cause and effect of ways that you can cause harm. And therefore, when you clean that up, you'll see improvements in your life because you're making wiser decisions and experiencing more wholesome results. He teaches this more conduct in the Eightfold Path. This is a core central teaching that you need to learn. It's part of all of our foundational programs. You also need to learn the five precepts, which is integrated into the Eightfold Path. And you may have been exposed to some of these things before, but you may not have learned with the original words of the Buddha. It's so important to learn with the original words of the Buddha. And that's what this book series does. And that's what all the classes, courses, and retreats that I share that they do. I share the original words of the Buddha because he provides very illuminating language. Sometimes people think that the Buddha taught no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no lying, and no intoxicants. He actually didn't teach this. He doesn't speak that way. That sounds like a bunch of rules, a bunch of commandments. It sounds like black and white. This isn't the way a Buddha teaches. They provide much more illuminating language that's going to guide you in life. So all of these books and all these classes and courses and programs, you'll be able to learn with the original words of the Buddha, learn about this moral conduct, integrate into your life and experience improvement. And then that's what will help you to build confidence because you'll see the improvement to your mind and to your life. Then the Buddha talks about some other different things here. Number three, he's talking about developing wholesome friends, companions, and comrades. This is an important 
part of the journey to enlightenment is that you make friends who are into wholesome things. Whereas if you had friends or people around you that were into unwholesome things, your mind's going to tend to be influenced by that and lean towards those things. So if you've ever been around people who use drugs or alcohol or who use profanity or steal or things like this or lie, you will tend to do those same things too. But by you making decisions to associate with wholesome individuals without judging people, but by having wise decision making to involve people in your life that are into positive, wholesome things, you'll tend to do those kinds of things as well. Um, here, uh, this number four, this one is actually really key for students who are learning that the Buddha talks about an individual who's easy to correct. Oftentimes when a student's coming to learn with the teacher, they don't always have an open mind. They're not always truly interested in learning. They might show up to a temple, they might show up to sit with a teacher, but their mind is actually rejecting what it is that a teacher is actually sharing with them that can be beneficial. What the Buddha is saying is that in order for you to make progress on the path, as you're learning from a teacher, you need to be receptive of that learning. That if you were to show up to a learning environment where you weren't interested in learning, and you were just rejecting whatever the teacher had to share with you, this is actually working against you. It's very unwise to do that. It's actually a waste of your time. So it's important to receive instruction respectfully and patiently. That's what the Buddha is talking about here, that someone's easy to correct. Because in order to get to enlightenment, you're going to need guidance from a teacher. And oftentimes when the mind is polluted, it doesn't see its own difficulties. It doesn't see its own struggles. That's why it's continuing to be in the struggle, because it lacks wisdom. The unenlightened the mind just doesn't understand what it doesn't understand. So you're not going to see your own ego, for example, or you might not see your own unwise speech and the way that you interact with somebody. You might not see your own ill will, your own judgment of other beings. So an individual who is a teacher can point those things out to you and then help you and guide you. But if you were to reject those kinds of things, you're not actually going to be able to make progress on the path. And it would be very unwise to be in that situation where you're choosing to sit with somebody, but then when they're sharing with you to be able to help you, you're just rejecting what it is that they have to say. Because a teacher who's sharing these teachings with you, they're not doing it for their own benefit. They're doing it to help you, right? A teacher who's really sharing these teachings in the way that the Buddha taught, they're not asking for money. They don't have any prices for their courses or their books or the things that they share. They're just sharing openly and freely with individuals helping them on the path to enlightenment. So a teacher's role is to help a student and point out treasure for them. And a student, if they would like to get to enlightenment and they have a sincere interest to do so, they would sit with that person and then be able to be receptive and understanding of that teaching to then be able to implement it and be able to help them. So that's what the Buddha is saying here is easy to correct, patient, receives instruction respectfully. And then he talks about some other things here in terms of various things. Um, this one, number seven, I'll talk about, and then I'll open up to any questions that you guys have. Here he's talking about a rising energy to abandon unwholesome qualities. In order to get to enlightenment, like we were just talking, you're going to need to apply effort and energy, right? You're going to need to have motivation and encouragement. Whereas if you're complacent or you're just kind of lackluster about what it is that you're doing in life, you're not actively pursuing the path, you're not going to be able to make progress. So sometimes people are just kind of casual observers right? And this is the case sometimes when you come to a temple environment or you come into a community of people, you might just be a casual observer. But if you're really interested in getting to enlightenment, you're going to need to actively be on the path, arise energy and effort to study the teachings, examine them, roll up your sleeves, sink your teeth into the teachings, ask questions, gain clarification, learn how to meditate, be meditating regularly. You gradually build up your life practice. And this is arising the energy to eliminate certain unwholesome qualities in your mind and then arising the wholesome qualities. So do you guys have any questions on this chapter? There's quite a few things that the Buddha is talking about here, but anything you guys would like to ask, you're welcome to ask about. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So let's go to the next chapter. These chapters get a lot shorter as we go here today in the particular chapters. This is chapter number 23. Someone would like to read this? Steve, you had your hand up earlier. Yeah. Uh, the perfectly enlightened one taught monks to eat at a single session. On one occasion, the perfectly enlightened one taught the monks the benefits of eating in a single session, that one will be free from illness and affliction and will enjoy lightness, strength and a comfortable residing. 
Uh, but Bardi told the perfect one that he was not willing to do so. Then the perfect enlightened one agreed to follow Bardi to keep food for the next meal. Again, Bardi to- told the perfectly enlightened one he was not willing to do that either. Then the venerable Bardi did not present himself to the perfectly enlightened one for a whole of three month period until the robe making period where monks said to Bardi that his action was inappropriate. Bardi then went to see the perfectly enlightened one. Venerable sir, a wrongdoing overcame me. It was like an unwise person, confused and blundering, when a training precept was being made known by the perfectly enlightened one. When the community of monks was undertaking the training, I declared my refusal to observe your teaching. Venerable sir, may the perfectly enlightened one forgive my wrongdoing, seen as such for the sake of restraint in the future. Surely, Bali, a wrongdoing overcame you. In that, like an unwise person, confused and blundering, when a training precept has, was being made known to, by me, when the community of monks was undertaking the training, you declared your refusal to practice this teaching. What do you think, Bali? Suppose a monk here were one liberated in both ways, and I told him, Come, monk, be a plank for me across the mud. What would... Would he walk across himself or would he dispose his body otherwise or, or would he say no? No, venerable sir. What do you think, Budley? Suppose a monk here were one liberated by wisdom, a body witness, one attained to view, one liberated by confidence, a teacher, a follower, a confidence follower. And I told him, come monk, be a plank for me across the mud. Would he walk across himself or would he dispose his body otherwise or would he say no? No, venerable sir. What do you think, Budley? Were you on that occasion one liberated in both ways, or one liberated by wisdom, or by or a body witness, or one attained to view, or one liberated by confidence, or a teaching follower, or a confidence follower? No, venerable sir. Budley, on on that occasion, were you not empty, unwise, mistaken? Yes, venerable sir. Venerable sir, a wrongdoing came to me in that like an unwise person, confused and blundering, when a training precept was being made known by the perfectly enlightened one, when the community of monks was undertaking the training, I declared my refusal to practice this teaching. Venerable Sir, may the perfectly enlightened one forgive my wrongdoing, seen as such for the sake of restraint in the future. Surely, Budley, a wrongdoing overcame you, in that like an unwise person, confused and blundering, when a training precept was being made known by me, when the community of monks was undertaking the training, you declared your refusal to practice the teaching. But since you see your wrongdoing as such and make apologies in accordance with the teaching, we understand you, for it is growth in the noble one's discipline when one sees one's wrongdoing as such and makes apologies in accordance with the teachings by undertaking restraint for the future. Okay, thank you, Steve. So this is a very interesting uh, teaching here. The Buddha was teaching his ordained practitioners to eat just one meal a day. And the reason why is that uh, it helps you to eliminate central desire. You don't have to eat just one meal a day in order to get to enlightenment, but you do need to learn to eat in moderation, where you're not gorging on food, you're not overeating, and you're not eating based on emotion. If you've ever been angry or sad or frustrated and you turn to food in order to get pleasant feelings, this is the underlying problem that the mind experiences is craving, desire, attachment. It's the longing, the yearning. The mind's basing its inner feelings on some thing, some conditional experience. So sometimes when you've been sad, perhaps you might have turned to chocolate cake or ice cream or some other food in order to restore some kind of pleasantness in the mind. But that pleasantness is just temporary because it's based on food. What the Buddha is guiding you to is eliminating craving, desire, attachment so you can get to permanent joy, permanent happiness. So he teaches you to eat in moderation because it causes less strain on the body and it helps you in life to cultivate the mind because you're not basing your inner feelings on food. So as a household practitioner, you're going to need to eat more than once a day because you're going to have various activities, but you need to learn learn to eat in moderation and not to eat based on emotion. But here we're getting more than that in this particular teaching, which is this particular student uh, refused to practice what it is that the Buddha was teaching. And that's fine. If a student refuses to practice what a teacher is teaching, 
a teacher, if they're enlightened, they're not going to be attached to you practicing their teachings. As you can see, the Buddha was very calm, very patient. He wasn't upset. He wasn't angry. He was just like, okay, well, you know, he chose not to learn this teaching. He chose not to, to practice it. That's that person's choice. The Buddha's mind's already peaceful and already joyful. He's not going to get angry. He's not going to get mad just because a student chooses not to learn his teachings, right? But here we get some insight here because what the Buddha is basically saying when he gets down here is he says, okay, if, if somebody was enlightened and I said to them, you know, will they lay down and be a plank for me and allow me to cross the mud? Then this person, his student said, no, the enlightened being wouldn't do that, right? They wouldn't lay down and let you walk over top of them, right? And then the Buddha kind of goes through these various things and he says, okay, well, were you enlightened when, you know, you, uh, when I shared this teaching and I suggested to you to only eat once a meal uh, or once a day, and he says, no, I wasn't enlightened. And he says, well, of course, you're going to refuse to do that particular thing because you weren't even enlightened and you don't have the wisdom to understand what it takes to get to enlightenment. So when I shared this teaching, you're not going to be able to see the truth and understand why it's important to practice this teaching. So your refusal to learn it and practice it is understandable because your mind is polluted with these pollutions. So of course, you're going to refuse to do this thing because even an enlightened being if I said something like lay down on the floor and let me walk across this mud puddle they're going to refuse that too and they're actually enlightened and the underlying meaning here is that the Buddha sharing is I wouldn't ask you to lay down and let me walk across the mud only teaching that I'm sharing with you is only going to help you to improve your mind and improve your life it's going to help you to get to enlightenment I wouldn't ask you to lay down and let me walk across the mud puddle so even an enlightened being if I ask them to do that, they're making the wise choice to not lie down. But of course, the Buddha is not going to ask a student to lay down and walk across the mud. That's not what a Buddha would do. So in this situation, the Buddha is reminding the student, hey, I'm only sharing information with you that is going to be helpful and beneficial to you. And of course, in some situations, you're not going to be able to see the truth in that teaching right away and immediately, and you're going to potentially refuse it. But since you see what you did, since you're making apologies for that, no worries. Come on and come learn again, right? The Buddha is not going to reject this student just because he refused to practice a certain teaching. That's not the way that a Buddha teaches. A Buddha is going to have unconditional love. And he understands that his students are struggling, that there's going to be certain defilements and pollutions that that student is struggling through. And they're not going to be able to understand the teachings right away. They're not going to get the teachings right away. They're going to struggle and have difficulties. But where a student understands and they uh, understand perhaps that they made some mistakes, maybe they apologize. Okay, you know, come, come learn. No big deal. Um, a Buddha is not going to be upset about that. So this is what you can glean from a, a conversation like this. You're going to struggle on the path to enlightenment, but it's the last struggle of all struggles that when you walk through these struggles, you'll overcome them by cultivating wisdom and then you won't struggle anymore in life. By the time you get to enlightenment, your life is completely at ease. There's no struggles. There's no difficulties. It's completely at ease. But on the way to enlightenment, you're going to struggle and you're going to potentially say something that's disrespectful to your teacher sometimes. But if you see that disrespect and then perhaps maybe you apologize to them, that would be really wise for you because that's going to keep your gamma clean. Same thing if you said something disrespectful to your mom or your dad or your brothers or sisters, it's wise to apologize to them and let them know that, hey, I apologize. I'm so sorry. And then aim to do better because then you're actually seeing the real work that you need to do. Whereas if you avoid that and you don't actually confront your own mind for that disrespect of your mom or your dad or your brothers or your sisters, you're not actually aiming to do better and you're not actually cultivating the wisdom to do better, which means you're going to keep doing this over and over and over again. So this is great that this student acknowledged that they did something that was disrespectful, that they, it sounds like what happened is when the Buddha was teaching, this person probably blatantly blurted out that they were going to refuse to practice what it was that the Buddha was teaching. Well, okay, you know, if they're choosing not to practice something, that's fine, but kind of blatantly blurting it out while the Buddha is teaching would be unwise to do, right? Because that's kind of uh, detracting from the environment of the learning. So any questions on this chapter? No questions? Okay, so let's go to the next one.
By the way, here you can learn where I teach about how the teachings of the Buddha, they're not rules of forbidden activity. They're guidance that leads to enlightenment. Sometimes people look at the, the teachings of the Buddha as rules. They're not actually rules. They're guidance that's going to help you to understand your mind, understand the world around you. And then through that guidance, you'll be able to then awaken to the wisdom of enlightenment. So you can read about that in there. Okay, so here's another one, chapter 24. This is much shorter. Would somebody like to read this one? This is a great chance to practice your English if you're learning English. Rex, are you learning English? You like to practice? Yeah, go ahead. Get a microphone. I saw Rex leaning toward a microphone. <laughs> Would you like to practice your English, Rex? <laughs> The noble disciples will not transgress the training goodness, even for life's sake. Just as Panharada, the great ocean is stable and does not overflow its boundaries. So too, when I have prescribed and training goodness for the disciples, they will not do wrong even for life's sake. This is the second astounding and amazing quality that monks see in these teachings and dissemble, because of which they are placed in it. Here granted only one of eight astounding and amazing qualities that monks see in these teachings and dissembling. Good. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, you don't have to read any of that other stuff. That's just that's just this part. So I'll teach from here. Yeah. So here what the Buddha is describing is that once you learn his teachings and you penetrate them and you examine them and you reflect on them and see the truth for yourself and you start practicing them and you see the, the real effect that it has to the condition of your mind and in your life, he's saying that you wouldn't stop practicing these even for a life's sake, meaning that if it was a matter of life or death, you would choose death over not practicing these teachings by the time you actually fully penetrate these teachings because you'll know that it would be highly unwise to do something opposite of the teachings. So for example, if you are enlightened and say you were uh, deserted on a desert island and it was a matter of killing that animal and eating or just starving, the Buddha is saying you would starve because you would know that it would be very unwise to kill that animal. It's just something you wouldn't be able to bring yourself to do, for example. Because you understand in killing another animal what this does to that being and that you wouldn't be interested in causing this harm. Now, in the unenlightened state, you're not going to necessarily be at that point, right? Like you might decide, like, yeah, I need to kill this animal to stay alive. And this might be a wise decision for you at that particular time in your life because you're not yet enlightened and you would like to get to enlightenment and you need to sustain your life. But here the Buddha is saying that if you've deeply penetrated his teachings, you wouldn't stop practicing them even in the most extreme circumstances. You will still practice his teachings closely. And that's the case that you'll see as you learn and develop them more and more closely. So any questions on this teaching here? No? Okay. So let's go to this next one. Let's see. Um, this is about moral conduct. Yeah, we can learn this one. Would somebody like to read this one? Sure, go ahead, Rachel. For defilements of aesthetics and Brahmins. So two monks, there are four defilements of aesthetics and Brahmins because of which some aesthetics and Brahmins do not shine, blaze, and radiate. What for? There are some aesthetics and Brahmins who drink liquor and wine and do not refrain from drinking liquor and wine ingest substances that cause heedlessness. This is the first defilement of aesthetics and Brahmins because of which some aesthetics and Brahmins do not shine, blaze, and radiate. There are some aesthetics and Brahmins who indulge in sexual intercourse and do not refrain from sexual intercourse. This is the second defilement of aesthetics and Brahmins because of which some aesthetics and Brahmins do not shine, blaze, and radiate. There are some aesthetics and Brahmins who accept gold and silver and do not refrain from receiving gold and silver. 
This is the third defilement of aesthetics and Brahmins, because of which some aesthetics and Brahmins do not shine, blaze, and radiate. There are some aesthetics and Brahmins who earn their living by wrong livelihood and do not refrain from wrong livelihood. This is the fourth defilement of aesthetics and Brahmins, because of which some aesthetics and Brahmins do not shine, blaze, and radiate. These are the four defilements of aesthetics and Brahmins, because of which some aesthetics and Brahmins do not shine, blaze, and radiate. Okay, thank you, Rachel. So here, when the Buddha is talking about shine, blaze, and radiate, what he's talking about is the enlightened mind, that when you have pollution of your mind, you're not going to be radiant. You're not going to be bright. You're not going to have this brightness in the mind. But by the time you clarify your mind, you purify the mind, you cleanse the mind of these pollutions, you'll see that the mind is bright and radiant. It shines through because the natural mind without its pollutions will experience this brightness and this radiance that will shine through. And here, the aesthetics and Brahmins, these are individuals who should be, if since that's what they're choosing for their their lifestyle is on the path to enlightenment and training their mind to get to enlightenment so they can be of service to other people by getting to enlightenment you would have had to cultivate the wisdom yourself to get to enlightenment and then you can share it with other people to be able to get to enlightenment and the buddha is saying okay there's certain ordained practitioners and there's certain brahmin who are hindu priests who don't shine and they don't blaze and they don't radiate they don't have this enlightened mind because during the lifetime of the buddha as i mentioned there were multiple teachers who were teaching and sharing that it was their teachings that led to enlightenment and there were various aesthetics that were learning from those teachers but they weren't necessarily sharing the original teachings that it takes that the buddha was teaching that the buddha's teachings we know lead to enlightenment because many people have attained enlightenment with his teachings but that's also why they're still around today because they actually work. So the Buddha is providing this guidance of these individuals of why it is that they're not actually getting to enlightenment, that there were certain aesthetics in Brahman during his lifetime, and there's even some today that will use substances that cause heedlessness. You might see this from time to time, that there's some ordained <laughs> practitioners who are choosing to use substances and they're not going to get to enlightenment as long as they're doing that. You might see certain aesthetics or Brahmin who are indulging in sexual activity, right? As, again, in order to get to enlightenment, an individual would need to ultimately eliminate sexual activity, but you can get to the second stage of enlightenment while, while still maintaining a sexual relationship. And some people choose to hang out there for a while in the second stage of enlightenment because you can do all the other work on the path to enlightenment and still be hanging out in that second stage of enlightenment and your life's going to be quite peaceful, quite joyful. But you're going to occasionally get agitated and annoyed when you want sex and you can't get it. You've probably experienced that if you're sexually active, you've gone through periods of time where you weren't able to get sex and you were kind of agitated and annoyed and frustrated. This is not going to promote peacefulness and joy that is permanent. So as long as someone's having sex, you're going to have agitation and annoyance sometimes. But when you eliminate sexual desire and craving for sexual contact, you can get to that peace and the joy. So as an aesthetic or a Brahmin, these are people who are choosing that life to let go of sexual activity right away, right up front. Whereas a household practitioner, you can choose when or if you'd ever like to let go of sexual activity. But as a person who's uh, an aesthetic or a Brahmin, the Buddha sharing, this is the reason why they're not getting to enlightenment is because they're still having sexual activity. Then number three, he's talking about accepting gold and silver, that during his lifetime, he didn't even accept any kind of currency of wealth. He would only accept food, water, clothing, shelter, and medical care. That's all he would accept. He didn't need gold and silver and things like this because he lived side by side with his students. They would invite him to come live inside their house, and he would stay there for weeks at a time, sometimes months. He wouldn't stay longer than four months because they needed to invite him. And then if they invited him and they let him stay there, then he would stay. But if he was going to go past four months, they would need to invite him again to stay uh, for more time. So he had food, clothing, shelter, and medical care available to him readily. Nowadays, we do accept financial support because we don't have a student with us every single second. You know, when we go to eat or we go on a bus or we need to go somewhere or travel or we need to buy clothes or something like this, there's not a student standing right there with us. So we do accept 
uh, financial support now. But the reason why he didn't do it is because the mind can crave, it can hold on, it can really want wealth and material wealth and material gain. And this is going to hinder you from getting to enlightenment. So by him having eliminated it, it's one less thing that the mind needs to uh, eliminate in terms of a craving. But you can have money and not be attached to it. You just need to train your mind to learn how to do that, that you're not basing your inner feelings on the amount of money that you have. Like if your bank account is this, you might be happy. But then when your bank account goes here, you'll be sad or frustrated. This is the mind in the unenlightened state. But by the time you get to enlightenment, no matter what your bank account balance is, you maintain your happiness. You maintain your joy. You're not basing your inner feelings on the level of your bank account. So that's why he taught during his lifetime not to receive gold and silver because he could live his life without it because he lived side by side with his students. But nowadays we need to accept a certain amount of financial support in order to help us accomplish the things that we need to accomplish. Then the number four, he's talking about wrong livelihood. This is how you choose to sustain your life in the world. That as aesthetics and Brahmin, the Buddha provided extensive amounts of livelihood about ways to conduct your life and sustain your life. What a livelihood is, is how you choose to sustain your life in the world. So your livelihood is like your job or your occupation or whatever you do to acquire income. That's your livelihood. So if somebody has wrong livelihood, meaning they're causing harm through their livelihood, this harm is going to come back to them. So the Buddha would teach to practice a livelihood where you're not sustaining your life off of harm to other people. So he would teach you to do things like you're not selling weapons, living beings, meat, substances that cause heedlessness and poisons. If you're selling these kinds of things, you're sustaining your life off of causing harm to other beings. And this harm is going to come back to you because of the natural law of gamma. This is why if I stood on the street corner and sold crystal methamphetamine into my community, I'm going to most likely get robbed, beat up. I could get murdered. I can get arrested. I can get addicted to these substances, have all kinds of difficulties coming back to me because of my unwise decision to sell substances that cause heedlessness. So the Buddha gives five livelihoods that would be unwise for us to practice selling weapons, living beings, meat, substances that cause heedlessness and poisons. And you can independently reflect on those and see for yourself that, yeah, if you based your livelihood on that, you'd be causing harm to others. And now this harm can easily come back to you as part of the natural law of gamma. But if you're interested in getting to enlightenment, it would be very hard for you to get to the peace and joyful mind and peaceful and joyful life if you're constantly experiencing harm coming back to you and people are trying to harm you, people are trying to beat you up, people are trying to murder you, you wouldn't be able to get to a peaceful and joyful life because you'd be running for your life constantly because of the harm that you're causing. So yes, you need to meditate in order to get to enlightenment, but you need this wisdom of how to practice and make wise decisions in the world. You wouldn't be able to get to a peaceful and joyful mind and a peaceful and joyful life by just meditating. You need the wisdom of the natural laws of existence. And one of those things is about your livelihood and how you choose to sustain your life. So the Buddha would teach a specific type of livelihood that would help his ordained practitioners radiate and, and what he's talking about here, shining and blazing, where your mind can be peaceful and joyful, knowing that you're not causing any harm to anybody. Whereas if you're performing a livelihood where you're causing harm to others, you'll be fearful. You might feel guilty. You might feel shameful in what you're actually doing. And this will make it difficult for you to sleep. This will be difficult for you to walk down the street. You'll be kind of scared and worried about what might happen to you, right? But when you're doing things that you're not causing harm to anybody, your mind can be at ease because you know that no harm is going to come back to you based on the decisions that you're making. So any questions on this particular teaching? No questions? Okay, I don't see any online either. Okay. Let's study one more. Let's see what this next one is, and then we'll kind of finish for today. Let's see what it is first. Uh, actually, we'll just make that one our last one. I think we'll make that one a last one. If you guys would like to read these others, usually I do 10 per class. And I teach this class here in the morning at 9 a.m. And I teach it in the evenings at 9 p.m. from home. And when I teach it at home, I make sure I do all 10 chapters. And then it's available on YouTube, on our podcast, on our Facebook page. And these books are available for you to read them as well. But when I come to the temple like this, depending on 
the conversation, you know, we just go up until 11 o'clock and wherever we end is where we end. So we've studied five chapters today. I think that's wonderful that you guys got a chance to learn what it is that the Buddha taught. <laughs> but if you guys would like to learn further, you can look at these books and investigate them further. You can also attend online this evening or listen to the podcast that, uh, that I'll be publishing as part of recording that particular class. And anytime you guys would like to learn, you're always welcome to come here or attend online. <clears throat> Tomorrow is going to be our group learning program where we just restarted that about a month ago and we're now in chapter one of volume one <clears throat> and what I'm going to be doing each Sunday is going chapter by chapter by chapter by chapter it has about 24 chapters and some other teachings or other other content so over the next six months every Sunday I'm going to be going chapter by chapter by chapter so if you'd like to come tomorrow the topic of chapter one is universal teachings love no harm and good morals. This is where you're going to learn about how the teachings of the Buddha have some commonalities between Hinduism, Christianity, Muslim teachings, and other teachings that you see in the world. Oftentimes people like to kind of say, you know, what we're doing is right and everybody else is wrong. And what this group is doing is right and everybody else is wrong. But what I invite you to do in this very first chapter of the book is look at the similarities and the commonalities among these teachings and see that there's these universal teachings that really connect things like Hinduism, Christianity, Muslim teachings, Buddhist teachings, Judaism, and a number of other things that have been shared in the world. In my opinion, the Buddha provides the complete package that's going to be able to help you to get to enlightenment, but there's definitely some value in seeing the commonalities in these other traditions. So rather than fight over who's right and who's wrong, what you'll see in this chapter and what you hear me talk about tomorrow is there's uh, some benefit to all of these things, and you can glean benefit from all of them. So we're going to be discussing that tomorrow. And then on Wednesday, I'm going to be doing a second class of a th four part series where I'm going to be teaching loving kindness meditation on Wednesday and doing loving kindness meditation with the students. And then I'll open up to any and all questions that you guys have. So you guys are always welcome to attend these things. You can attend them here online. Our website has all the details of how to attend online. You can also come talk to me or send me private messages, schedule personal guidance. There's lots of ways for you to get help. So if you're done with the anger and the sadness and the frustration, and you're interested in getting to the peace and joy, the teachings of the Buddha and the resources and the ability for you to get the help is here for you. So thank you all for joining. Thank you for coming to class. Thank you for all of you online. And if you'd like to join any of these future classes, perhaps I'll see you then. So have a lovely rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Sawadikap. Sawadikap. again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much.